My name is Clifford Kwa, and when I was in, a student at the Jack Residential School, my number was 26. And to this day, I, it's always been in my head, ingrained in my head. And how the, I'm not going to go into the history of numbering, but one of the reasons why they gave us numbers, well, I thought it was uh, the amount of students. Say there's 90 boys, 90 girls, 180 students. How could you remember all their names? So they gave us numbers. But still to me it was uh, dehumanizing. Instead of calling my name Clifford, they called me uh, number 26. And everything we did in the school is all numbers. And I can rattle off from 1 to 80, well, part of uh, the number system, 1 to 80, I can pick out a number and give you the name of that person. For instance, number 37, that would be Thomas Pierre. Number 72 would be David Isaac. Number 45 would be my brother Peter Kwa. Number 22 would be Dominic Frederick. And it's funny how I can remember all that. And yet, as I went going through school, I was, I blanked most of my experiences, blanked it out. And I'm also a recovering alcoholic. The reason why I included that, that part about a recovering alcoholic is that I had drank for 17 years, drinking every day, day in, day out, to forget. But then you can't forget the, it's all the emotional pain I went through, physical pain, everything. And when, while in Lijak, we were considered savages, dirty Indians. And, and I often thought the residential schools were built for the Indians alone, Indians of Canada. They wanted to assimilate and educate. Then the Roman Catholic Church stepped in, we we're gonna run them schools. So now we're gonna convert these savages to good Christians. And I thought about it, oh boy. What? <laughs> First of all, we didn't understand Christianity and I would, how we all was kneeling and praying, all the kneeling and praying, praying. For what? We didn't understand. We just went through the motions. As I said before, we're trained and conditioned. And uh, what we learned in that school was basically nothing. We did not have the formal education. It taught us the basics, but at the same time, they're. Uh, how would I put it, brainwashing you, religion. And they're always putting us down. And they're always calling us down. That's where all this, you know, you get this shame, toxic shame. And it's drilled into your head. And for years I was like that, for years. I was, you know, I was ashamed of this, ashamed of that. Ashamed of my dad, my parents, ashamed of my community. Brainwashed into you. You're ashamed of everything. Ashamed of your name. Ashamed of who you are. Because they call us rotten Indians, dirty rotten Indians, savages. And they're always swearing at us. Priests and brothers. How come you're swearing you're supposed to be a uh, priest and brother? After I left school, it was still in, inside of me. Toxic shame. It took me a long, long time to get over it. I was, you know, ashamed of being who I was. And ashamed of my name, ashamed of everything. Then later on I had 
I was reading stories about Chief Kwah from Fort St. James. And it's sort of, you know, then that gave me new meaning to my name. Oh, Chief Kwa? Oh, so I'm a sort of descendant from Chief Kwa. Okay, that, that sounds good. So I got rid of that shame. You know, every time I go to town or somewhere, I'm always, you know, hang back. Because of being ashamed of who I am, an Indian. But in those days, you, there was racism, but not at the scale that it is today. Racism is, uh, for example, at Shelley, we intermixed with the, uh, we worked in a sawmill, and they had white, German, all these people. And then the Indians came, and we sort of mixed, mixed together. That's from eight to five. After that, we went back to our community. Because there's a thin line, Indian white. We never cross that boundary. Just, you know, subtle racism. But nowadays it's gotten out of hand. Racism is something that, that is learnt at home. One good example is um, Kelly Road senior secondary school. About two, three years ago, we, I attended a school board meeting and Chief Poutney suggested that we change that name to, not from Kelly Road, we wanted a Dakat name, Indian name. We wanted to call it Chess T School and translation was the Big Grizzly School. Right? And they put it forward and they accepted it at the school board meeting. Then they hit the people of North Kelly. Holy man, we opened a can of worms. They were calling us down everything. They had, they had all these uh, gatherings putting us down for, for us to wanting to rename that school. Jesus had 10,000 signatures to not to name that school, to give it a Dakhet name, Indian name. And all the rednecks came out. Oh, you want to see it? Oh. And I, for a while I stayed away from Hart Highway. I didn't want to go up there. So I just stayed away. But then I, gradually, I, as it died down, they finally, you know, accepted it. So now it's called Shas. T. Kelly Road. They combine. There's Section 20 of the Indian Act that states all children from the from age of 5 to 18 years of age have to attend a residential school. You don't comply? Well, most reserves in northern BC, they had an Indian agent. He had a lot of power, a lot of power of our, on our people, First Nation people in Canada. And what he did was take a law enforcement officer, one or two, and then go to each reserve and grab all these, round all these children up, take them back to the jack. In our community, we went willingly no fuss or muss, we just put us on the train and took us to the jack. When I looked, got out of the train and looked, holy cow, it was a big school. Big imposing school. My first thought was, how far away from home? Little did we realize it was 200 kilometers. It brought us up to the school, took our clothes away, gave us a haircut, buzz cut, <laughs> then they deloused us. White powder, they poured all over you. Then they issued you clothes, good clothes, and go to class clothes and work clothes. And from there, they led us up to the dorms. 
we call it high dorm. High dormitory is from children were from five, five years of age to nine, nine years of age. And that the dorm was about 30 by 40 feet, 1,200 square feet. And there were 40 of us. We were crammed in there. And every night for the first month, all I heard is crying, crying, crying. I want to go home. Where are my parents? Same thing to me. Crying for my parents, crying for my community. I want to go home. And after a month, it sort of, you know, petered out. We just finally accepted that we were here for the duration of the school year. And we couldn't do a thing. We just accepted it. Monday morning, first day of class, we were in kindergarten. All the big boys, they call it uh, baby class. They say, you, you're gonna be in baby class. What, what's baby class? Oh, kindergarten. And we, most of it, from kindergarten, grade one, two, three, four, grade five. In all the years of that, you know, that gone to the school as I blanked it out. And I couldn't figure out why till I realized the trauma that, I, that was inflicted on me and my mind couldn't handle it. So I blanked it out. So did most of the children in the high dorm, high dormitory. It's on the third floor. There's a second floor is intermediate boys. On the other side is big boys. Same with the girls. High dorm, intermediate girls, big girls. And then we had a common hall, big hall, cement floors. Then all these years, I never, you know, blanked out, I just barely remember. And I was looking through my school records, and it says grade two and three failed. I had to re redo grade two and three. That's how much it affected me. And while in all that, in the school, so-called schools, we only had uh, two, two teachers that were trained as teachers. And I, to this day, I always remember her name, Mrs. Higgins. She taught grade three. She taught in a way that she cared for the students. And the other one would be Mr. Lally. He taught grade seven, same thing. He cared for the students and how to educate them, do it the proper way. All the other grades were, were taught by a brothers or a sister or a, a priest. And when that happens, they're, they were trained in seminary or a nunnery. And the first thing that comes to mind to them is religion. So they will teach religion. I never had so much religion in my life. Things I didn't understand. Uh, we had the, I went far as grade seven, by the way, <laughs> and we had a good teacher, Pat Lally. He cared about our, our education. We had homework, but we did it in a way it's from every Monday to Friday we had you call it night class. It's from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. in the grade six, seven, and eight. We went back to the classes and we did our homework. And still we never actually learned anything. You call it night classes. Food was uh, terrible. Poor nutrition throughout the, from the time I was there to the time I had left. Very poor nutrition. And when you have poor nutrition, you have stunted growth. And your mind, your mind is not developed, it's stunted. 
And for breakfast in the morning, we got um, porridge. Cold porridge, slice of bread, butter bread, and coffee. Warm coffee. And you had uh, skim milk powder mixed with water, just white enough to use on your porridge. And a lot of survivors have called all the residential schools mush hole. Because you had porridge every morning. Mush, we call it mush. Every morning. From, from September to June. Mush, mush, mush. Lunch was a slice of spam. We call it mystery meat. We didn't know what it was. In, didn't know how they made it, but it was food. And it had two really little slices. About that big. Two slices. One potato and coffee again. Bread. And we call it supper. I mean, a lot of times you get the I remember at one time we had supper, went in the dining room, all we had was a pancake with a syrup dribble on top, coffee again. That's all we had for supper. But we got through that and the most happiest times we had was in June. We started counting down the days to say June 19th, because we knew we were going home. We got home, and there were about 22 of us from uh, Lake Lee, or Shelley. We got home, and we never felt so free in our lives, because we cherish our freedom, right? We got home, and we never wasted a minute, an hour, a day, always on the go doing everything, and we had fun doing it. And I was telling uh, Mr. Brown while we were driving in, he, he thought fall time was the best time of the year. Everything, you know, turning trees, tur um, leaves turning and getting colder. And I looked at him, I don't look forward to fall. Said, Why? Because this time of the year, end of August, we're not looking forward to September, September 4th, simply because we were going to go back to Lejack. We we're heading back to that hated school. Our parents, they didn't give a fuss or muss, they just let us go. For the first four years, all our parents in Clay Lee, they were free for them children. It's a hard time keeping the hold of them children, especially when they're together. They're always gone. You don't know what they're up to, but they usually come home at night. They're tired, they're dirty, and they're happy. And they're hungry, of course. Then all that came to a screeching halt. We had to go back to school. As for our parents, I found out later that uh, most of the parents from Shelley had actually gone to that school in the 30s and the 40s, 1930s and 40s, had gone to that school. They came back and they, what they learned, they passed on to us, right? And in the 60s, early 60s, our Community was a, was a whole, whole community. Everybody cared for one another. Everybody helped one another. And as years went by, 62, 63, it started coming apart. And to this day, it's still the same. You have families here, here, here. No cohesion, no, no village anymore. Well, we learned from our parents and as survivors of school, we in, in, unintentionally 
pass it on to the next generation. And they're called intergenerational children. So we didn't, inadvertently, we taught them what we had learned. And they carried it. And gradually the community wasn't a community anymore. That our, our, our parents and the next generation survivors, they passed on to the intergenerational. It's four words. Don't ask for, don't ask for help in any way. Don't ask them about this. I want this. Don't ask them nothing. Because you knew the answer already. already. It's a big no, right? And the other two words is don't tell. It's, they're still, still in our community or any community in northern BC or all of BC, matter of fact. And that's where, you know, when they had them, um, they discovered the unmarked graves in Kamloops Residential School. Them four words fit in perfectly. Don't ask, don't tell. Don't tell them about children missing. Don't tell them about how one day you see three students, next day they're gone. Don't tell, don't ask where they went. And don't tell them how some of the survivors helped dig the graves, put them in the graves, covered them up, and then they had to live with this all their lives. It's all, you know, very deep. And another thing about don't tell about it is simply they've heard stories throughout Canada where the survivors finally telling the truth. They said, then they told us, to whoever would listen, that we saw them, we dug the graves, we, we, we buried about four bodies. And the graves are only shallow graves, four feet. And they buried them. And the uh, priests and brothers, they warned, they brought them up to to their office, see three students, big boys, they're about 14, 15 years old, brought them up to their office and they tell these students, don't tell, don't tell about what happened. They're looking at each other, they're, they're answered and they're just, in their mind is why. Don't tell them how you buried the children, four children. And that priest or brother will tell these students, you do tell, you're going to be the next one. And they clam right up to this day. Finally comes out truth. We were taken from our village, Shelley, in, in a, a September until June 19, 20th. And in between, in all these months, we didn't show emotion because we buried, buried the positive emotion. And we learned from each other, from the boys and girls in that school. If you showed any emotion, they laughed at you. That's what they did. Another example is uh, whenever we got the strap, the strap about that long, about that wide, about that thick, and very flexible. It's made out of uh, sort of a conveyor belt material. And you have to remember, the nuns and priests and brothers are grown men and women. And we're only, what, 10, 11, 12 years old. And they administer the strap. You have to hold out your hand. And they're going from here coming over, whap, you get it all the way from up to here. You have big red welts all the way down, both sides. That's five on each hand, five on the other. And as for, you don't show any emotions when, you, when that happens. You just gotta grin and bear it, and it hurts. It really hurts. You don't cry. You don't do nothing, just stand there and take it. 
because most of the boys, they thought it was, uh, <laughs> like I told uh, <laughs> Mr. Brown, it's unmanly, unmanly to cry, unmanly to show emotions, right? They had a um, marker, Era uh, not non-erasable marker, and they put in all your clothes, your underwear, t-shirts, everything. Number and then number, then they knew who it was right there. And uh, once a year, they, about September, they had uh, Brother Kearns told all the boys, bring all your clothes, everything, piled in front of you. If there's any missing, you're gonna go over there. And during the prior to September, you know, we lose clothes or somebody steals it or so old, we threw it away. And they went through my my gear. Look at, look at that, shoo, 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 hope. If you're missing this, you're missing this, you're missing this, go over there. And there was about 10 of us there sort of lined up. After he did all the inspections, he'd come over, go to the cabinet, open it, bring out the strap. And we'd catch 10 straps on each hand for simply missing, say, a glove, forgot it somewhere, or a handkerchief, or some other one pair of socks gone. That's how strict they were. And uh, throughout our lives, it was, to me, it was, I'm almost like that, very, you know, apprehensive about anything, I lose anything. And I get in a panic mode. I lost my phone, oh my. <laughs> or lost my gloves, where the heck? And then automatically I reflect back to the time. Time I lost stuff in the jack. Uh, that one winter I was, we're out skating rink, skating around, and I accidentally said a four letter word. And Philip Charlie was skating beside me, he heard that. I didn't think nothing of it. And he went to the Lacey Skates, went, put his skates away, then he ran to Brother Kearns. He told on me just to get on the good side, right? Because we're always, you know, watching one another. He made a mistake, do this, do that, they report to the priest or brother. And anyway, next morning, I didn't think nothing of it. Went down for breakfast. After breakfast, we went back to the hall and they called my name, Brother Kearns. I said, Clifford, come here. Yes, brother, walked up to him. Did you swear last night? Yes, yes. Okay, get on that table. Table's this high, stood on top, unwrapped it, bar of lye soap. Here, eat it. I looked at it, I looked at it. No. Eat it. No. And he went to the cabinets behind, opened the cabinet, they pulled out that strap. And he slapped it on his, his lap. Eat it. I took a big chunk. Hold it, hold it, spit it out. Another bite. And lye soap is very... Whew. After I finished eating, I gave him the soap. And said, hold out your hands. What? Five in each hand. And later on, about two hours later, my mouth was full of blisters. And to cool it off, I drank water. Couldn't eat for two days. 
And that's, that's the way it was run. The things that really happened, as I can tell it, all the rest of the survivors, well, it happened. Bury it. None of your business. I would like to, their life is, is only focused on what's ahead. And in residential school, when I was going to Lee Jacket, it's always, they instilled the fear into you because you're scared witless. And anything you do, it's, you're scared to do it simply because um, if you do it, then you have to do it right. Do it proper. If you do it wrong, holy man, it's around the school within two minutes. Then these boys and girls, they look at you and they start laughing at you and pointing their fingers. He, 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 he did this, he did this. Look at that stupid Indian. Fear. Fear of failure. And fear of success. It's still in the survivors I've known, I've met. Fear of success simply because uh, one example would, his first name is Roy, and he, he was a big boy, he was 14, 15. And we used to go out skating every night from six to nine o'clock in the winter. And we went skating, then we were watching Roy, Roy, and he was skating, holy man, he's doing fancy skating. And washed him, jeez, I wish I could do that. And to him, it's just effortless. The potential, he had the po potential to go further than that, be a figure skater. And we're watching him, holy, he's spinning around, do, the, do everything. We tried to do, boom, fell down. Try this, try this this way. Nope. He just, whoop, whoop, whoop. Where he went? And we're envious of him, right? And then uh, the word got out. We call him Fancy Skater. And the word got out, and all that, their envy of him, of him to be able to do that, especially on skates like this, what we had. And they were envious of him, and they started laughing at him and pointing at him. Fancy Skater, eh? I can do better than you. Try it. He told them, try it, no. And they kept ribbing them and, you know, bringing them down. Bringing them down to their level. That's where the fear of success comes in. Fear to this, fear to that. And I carried that through my years growing up. Always afraid of, you know, failing. It was always in me. Fear of success. When I do that, I'm always looking around, watching for people. And generally there are people around and they're looking at me. Holy man, he did it, success. And that's where the lateral violence comes in and on, on the reserve. They're scared. They're scared of his success. Oh, we can't have that. So, they're, they brought me down again. You belong here. You belong here, Clifford, not up there, here. So, the Jack School is self-sufficient, right? Own power, sewer, water. And there's Highway 16, the Jacks over here. The communication was very, very spotty. We didn't know about what was going on at home, Prince George, anywhere, as for that fact. We didn't know what was going on because we're stuck in this school. Put all the metal doors around it. We're stuck in there. Boys and girls rode home. I did too. And they'd get about, you know, Brother Kearns or Brother Callan and we'd get 10 letters a day. They'd hand it to them. Put an envelope, hand it to them. Thinking that, oh, that letter's gonna go home. See, to see how we were making out. And what the brothers did, they opened the letters and they read it. 
crumble it up, phew, right in the garbage can. All the letters, same way. Phew, the garbage can. So they cut us off. And when we got letters, it's the same thing. They read it, crumble the letter up from home. And they only give you an envelope, the original envelope, and they stamp on there. You have five dollars in your account, but you got to remember, parents just sent twenty dollars, right? Twenty dollar bill. Cash it in, and then they'd keep fifteen. School would keep fifteen, and they give you five dollars. Here, it's all you get. Of all things, most of the students, they bought rosaries. <laughs> I know it sounds kind of stupid, but we're so, you know, brainwashed with religion. We bought rosaries, real fancy rosaries. Then we go to the priest and he's blessed. There you go. <laughs> and we had chocolates. And, and they sold us ordinary ink pens. I had left in 64 and I got a job as a carpenter's helper. End of September, September, October, November, I worked four months. And we're building a house. And we got paid every two weeks, right? And I go cash my check and I go to the store, Shelly's store, and I get a $60 money order. That's a lot of money in those days. Fill out his name, everything, put it in an envelope, send it to him. That's every, what, $120 a month. That's how much I thought of my brother. I thought, and he got all the money, then the following year, he, he was in the Lejac band. They came to town for the Elks Media Parade. After he changed into his uh, clothes from his uniform, I asked Peter, Peter, where's all your money? He said, what money? I said, I sent you about $120 a month. Didn't you get any? He said, every two weeks I get $20, $40 a month. All the rest of the money they kept. And at that time we were blaming everybody, you know. I was putting the blame on everybody else. This time I blamed it on Brother Kearns. And years later, later I met him up at the, there's uh, Tim's Horton, Tim Horton's. And up College Heights, I and my girlfriend had gone in there for coffee. I was getting my order, I turned around. Here comes Brother Kearns. My coffee down, my glasses, and I looked at them all that rage and everything. Just came out. My girlfriend tried to stop me. Stay out of this. I looked at her. She backed up and waiting, waiting, waiting for Brother Kearns to get closer. He got closer, my hands were like this set myself, come on, a little more closer. I tell him, you bastard, I'm gonna drop you where you stand. And he looked at me and the eyes got big. He saw the rage and everything coming out of me. And he stopped and slowly backed out, back to the door. And I'm just standing there just shaking. Oh, geez, if I got a hold of him. I would have punched his lights out, grabbed them, and threw them through the window. That's how much rage it was contained inside of me. Because Brother Kearns, he was uh, one of the brothers of Jack. He's one of pedophiles. That's two reasons why I got mad at him. And my girlfriend, Clifford, what? I finally snapped out of it. Yes? He said, you're better than him. You're a way better person than him. Everything I just... 
it's all a rage and everything is still there. It's the negative is still there. You can get mad just like that. But most of it uh, is, as a former alcoholic, all this, you know, positive came up. We didn't know we were going to be, well, alcoholic. We started out on weekends. After that, developed, developed. next thing you know, alcohol control your lives. We drank it to hide the shame, hide the emotional part of us, toxic shame, all that. We drank to forget it. We didn't. Next morning, still there. And most survivors, they, like I said, they turned to alcohol. Now it's in the past. I've dealt with it. And there's another guy too, his brother, Callan. I never saw him after I left school. When I was waiting for him, he never showed up. He was the same thing, pedophile. Now there's one incident that really sticks in my mind. We were in the big boy's dorm. And we were getting ready for bed and brother Callan came upstairs, walked on the center aisle. He had a holster, a 38 pistol. I thought, what the hell is he carrying a gun around for? Everybody looked. And, uh, and a child in us got in the way. We were fascinated by guns, especially a pistol. You open the door, load it up, click. And they see that post over there. Boom. Ping. Boom. Cling. Wow. But to this day, why did he carry a pistol? Simply because he knew that as big boys, we will always remember. Always remember the things he did to us, like Brother Kearns, what he did to my brother. Brother Cattle and what of the things he had done. And like I said before, I waited for him, waited, waited, waited. He never showed up. In a way, I was glad, you know, glad he didn't. I would have jumped all over his head. Maybe he separated his head from his body. <laughs> but then again, I thought about that I'm a better person. Look what I've gone through. I've gone through alcoholism, residential school syndrome, I've gone back to school, and I came out of the school as an instructor. And that itself is a, an accomplishment that I'm very proud of. I am proud of myself. I'm proud to be called an Indian. I'm proud of what I've done to spread the, the history. You have built that road yourself. You're having a hard time. Right? And you will say yes. Okay, the only way to... You're having a hard time. You fell down. Get up. You fell down. Get up. Keep on. Sooner or later you're going to have... You're going to come to the end of the road. And that means to you is success. When you have success then you can look to the future. Find a goal. Go back to school. Keep your mind busy. Idle minds are <laughs> not a good thing. But keep your mind busy, occupied. If you go to school and you, you finish, keep on, find another goal. Keep on doing it. And they will ask me about, what did you do? And I'll tell them again, all my stories. And I'll give them a how I did it, when I did it, how I succeeded in my lifetime. It took me a while, but I did it. And I'm very proud and I'll tell them, tell them that you will one day feel the same way as I did. 
you have conquered all that, you have walked that road, you have built, rough road, but you came to the end of the road and there's a, you saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Now the world is opening up to you. Set a goal, accomplish, keep on. But you always have to remember, when you're on that road, the first thing that comes to mind is self-respect. Respect yourself for what you are. Respect yourself for you want to change yourself. Respect yourself for building that road. And understanding that one day you will come to the end of the road. And you will have success and a better way of life. Like I have. I'm a walking example. A lot of people don't think so, but they haven't asked me, right? And that's, well, my story is getting around. A lot of people are starting looking up, looking up to me. Hey, I know that guy. I saw him on TV. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And how do you feel being on TV? Just another medium. I said, but it's just, to me, just part of my job. I consider it part of my job. Sure, I'm on TV. Video cameras, everything. It's part of my job. That I've learned to learn to teach. Teach about the First Nations, the culture. At the same time, I teach them to all people. Everyone is included. And I see, and I'm glad, very glad to see that. And if this story can get out more, people listening and learning, learning more about the residential schools, how all the children suffered. Well, for example, myself, the only way I could, you know, get through it is um, education. You need to, to find out your problems and for me, it was a residential school syndrome. You have to educate yourself on, on, on that one problem. Learn more about it. Learn, 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 then put it in your head. Then set a goal. I'm going to overcome. I'm going to overcome what's bothering me. That way that once you you overcome the problem, set a goal. Aim, f aim for a specific goal. After you achieve that, keep on going. And usually the children, I tell them about that, and then, then I reflect on my, my experiences. I told them I had a lot, rough, rough time doing this. A lot of rough, I built this road that I am now residential school syndrome, a lot of times fell down, got up. Fell down, got up. And a lot of times, like I said before, I wanted to go back drinking. And two words came up, too easy. Same as you with a problem. Once you overcome it, it was easy, right? And keep on going. If you fall down, get up. You're thinking of doing something drastic. Just remember two words, too easy. Just keep on going. It's a rough road, but you have to, you made that road. Now you have to overcome it. And usually at the end of the road, there's somewhere along the road, there's a fork, fork in the road. You have to make sure you take the right one. If you go this way, you're going backwards, coming back again. You take this road, the right road, and you will notice your future is looking better. And instead of uh, reflecting on the past of what, what you had done, use that as a reminder. How easy to fall off, how easy to get, do this, how easy to to go back to where you belong again. 
starting over. I know most young people, you'll have to start over again. Just keep at it, keep at it. Eventually you get to the fork in the road and you can go to the right road. Then, there, then you're thinking, oh, look what I've done. And, you're, and the blinders come off and you're saying, hey, I'm thinking of the future. I'm thinking what's ahead. And it looks good. And you keep on doing that. Eventually you get to that part in the road where your life just changes. Completely change. And you're standing a little taller and look what I've done. And that's oh there's another thing. Else. All of us have eye problems, right? Eye problem? <laughs> No, it's, it's not I did it. I have done this. Yes, you have. I have overcame this. I have overcame alcohol. I have overcame residential school system. No, don't think like that. You had help. To me, it was a great spirit that was walking beside me. Every time I fell down, get up, get up, get up. And I didn't do this all by myself. It'd be pretty hard to do. Same with alcoholism. I didn't quit overnight, which I did, but with a lot of help, spiritual help. Same as, all, as you go through life. There's something always watching you. You know you don't feel him or see him. The Great Spirit is walking right beside you. And one thing I've got to add, that picture there, is all the girls. You have to remember, boys suffer, girls twice as worse. As I said before, we're trained and conditioned. And that's where that brother Callanan, remember that story? And what happens is when you're that trained and conditioned, he will go to the girl's side, say a 12 year old girl, you will walk and stand in front of me, you. she look up, up to the dormitory. she will jump up, instead of walking, she will run, run all the way up. And that's why, you know, uh, they suffered more, more than we did. And I was watching that CBC interview where the woman telling her story, and she started crying. Next day, I, I reviewed that interview when that lady came on, then I realized, fully realized then and there that these girls grown into women, they have suffered more than we did. And the more I looked at it, and I started crying too, finally realizing these poor women, poor girls, look what they went through. And um, to this day, I have more respect a lot, lot more respect for women, especially you, all the women, and especially, uh, I see them around town. These women that went to the residential school, I see them around town. They may drum, maybe alcoholics, or, but I respect them. I know what they went through. And they will come to me and they ask me questions and he said, Clifford, do you have any smokes? Here. In the light of cigarette, come up close to me, you got $10? <laughs> oh yeah, right there. I know where it's going to, but it's, you know, to me, to, I wish I could do better for them. To make them realize you can put this in the past. Try to heal yourself. And that's why I have a lot, lot more respect for, for the girls from a residential school. A lot of respect. Whenever I see one, I don't know, it just wants makes me, you know, what well, crying is no good. Well, I just want to, you know, break down and cry simply because of the way that the life they're living. 
And I'm just hoping and wish, geez, I wish I can get through these, these girls, get to their mind. Tell them I drank too. Tell them I quit this year. Tell them I never drank for 37 years. Why can't you start, do something positive for yourself? But then again, I thought, well, it'll go one year, come out the other. And like I said before, it's just that when I was an alcoholic, I just, you know, for 17 years, I finally got tired of it, to tell you the truth, tired of sleeping out, lies, stealing, borrowing, everything, all that. It came to a head one, one night and with a great spirit. And I, I just said two words, I quit, quit overnight, with no after effects. <laughs> and same with the uh, residential school syndrome. After I overcame that, oh boy, I wish some people on the streets would see me right now, what I had done. What they can do. It's always possible for them to do that, to overcome their addictions, find your place in life, find a goal, achieve your goal, keep on. Put all that, what you did before, put in the past and look to the future. The future is yours now, yours to control. I want to do this, I want to do this. Okay, go ahead, do it. But don't go back to the past. Just use, it, use your past as a reference, mm -hmm. like I have been doing whenever I do a lecture on this residential school history. I bring out a past with them for reference purposes. After it's I'm finished with it, I put it in a past where it belongs. And to me, truth and reconciliation is, why am I living this life? Why am I calling everybody down all this, all this negativity? And the truth is, you're doing it. So you got to admit to yourself the truth. So I told myself the truth, and it worked. Truth is, my life is not, not right. The truth is, I have to re tell myself that uh, I am an Indian, or as you people would say, First Nations. And I accept that. And the truth is that I have to tell other people the truth of what happened to me, to the residential schools, all that, all included. Reconciliation, reconciled with oneself. That means I had to examine my life from the time I left to present day, that I put myself through that. And the only way I could, you know, go about it is reconcile myself first. Okay, now I've done that. I know what I've done and I said, I'm gonna put that in the bag, put in the past. And reconciliation now is, I've done it to myself, truth and reconciliation. Now I want others to know. And I wish more people would be like you, to understand what residential schools, to understand the people, First Nation that went to these schools, how we suffered mentally, physically, and that's why they call us survivors. <laughs>